people believe in the rapture called the seven year tribulation. Mm -hmm. There's nothing about a seven year tribulation in the book of Revelation. There's nothing about a rapture, nothing about Jesus coming back to take people out, um, out of the world, to take his followers out of the world. He might be talking about people floating up in the sky. <laughs> yeah. But but he, they're floating up the sky not to be removed for at a rapture. They're welcoming Jesus down as the king of the earth. Okay. And as king of the earth, he's he he's coming to destroy his enemies. Mm. And that's that's for Paul how the kingdom of God comes. As Christ destroys his enemies, and only the, the righteous are, are left and they rule the earth. You know, and it's like it's like if you're you know if you're told that Puff the Magic Dragon is about marijuana, then you that's all you hear. You, you can't unsee it once you see it. You can't unsee it. <laughs> you, you can't get it out of your head. <laughs> and so, so but nobody would read the Book of Revelation to come away with a rapture in chapter yeah. four, they just, unless they were told that's what it is. Welcome back to the podcast. Uh, today we're sitting down with repeat guest, one of my favorite people, Dr. Bart Ehrman. And so Bart, uh, welcome back to the show. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. Yeah, well, thanks for having me again. I've always enjoyed it. Absolutely. So let's cut to it. You have a, a new book that at the time that this releases uh, will be out for the world to consume. Uh, the book is called Armageddon, what the Bible really says about the end. And so I wanted to open up the conversation uh, by reading a quote for our listeners, if that's okay with you. And then sure. we'll kind of release you to take us into the wild uh, a little bit. But the, the quote comes on page 110, so a little bit deeper into the book. And you say, the majority of people who read the book of Revelation never ask about its historical context and literary genre, even though they know, at least implicitly, that these things radically affect a text's meaning. When it comes to this book in particular, that is a terrible mistake. Now, obviously, genre and context are important for any ancient texts, but maybe talk to us a little bit about why that is all the more true for the book of Revelation, and then talk to us about the genre, the background, context of this particular book. What is going on in this book? We've all, we've all heard so many things, but solve the mystery for us, Bart. <laughs> okay. Well, just, just to, to explain for people who aren't sort of on top of uh, genre studies, mm -hmm. <laughs> most human beings. So uh, it, it can be expressed, the, the basic principle can be expressed pretty simply. And mm -hmm. I, I might actually use this example in my book. If you, you know, if you're, if you're reading, uh, if you're reading uh, something about a, a, uh, a scientific experiment in uh, New York City that's gone wrong and that a bacterium mm -hmm. has gotten out of the lab, and it's infected the water supply of New York City, uh, and it's going to be lethal. Uh, <laughs> you know, if you're reading this uh, in a science fiction novel, you pretty much know where it's going to go because you know mm -hmm. how science fiction novels work. Mm -hmm. If you read it on the front page of the New York Times, <laughs> you know where you're going to go. <laughs> right. <laughs> you're going to get out of there. And so it, it just depends what kind of writing it is. Yeah. And it's that way with books. You know, when you're reading a novel, Mm -hmm. uh, you're not reading a uh, you, you're not reading an op-ed. <laughs> when you're reading an op-ed, you're not reading a limerick poem. Mm -hmm. And so, whatever whatever kind of writing it is brings its expectation with it. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that we're used to a lot of genres. So we 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 know how to read a short story. We know how to read a novel. We know how to read uh, you know we know how to read the front pages of the New York Times. We know how to read things, mm -hmm. but. And just subconsciously, we don't even think about it. You know, we don't think, oh, now the genre of this is, you know, and then you, you just, don't, you just, because you know, mm -hmm. we don't, people don't know the genre of the book of Revelation because we don't have writings like that anymore. Yeah. And when you read the Revelation, if you read Revelation, like, uh, like I used to do, I'm sure you used to do, you know, when you're an evangelical Christian, you read it, say, whoa, this is like so far out there. This is like, this, this is unlike anything that's ever been written you know, for one thing, that must mean it's inspired by God. Because how could anybody possibly <laughs> come up be. with it? <laughs> right. And the other thing is, you know, it's since it stands on its own, yeah. you don't have any way of really kind of figuring it out until unless somebody tells you. Because mm -hmm. you know, you know, like if you read if you read twenty novels, you have a pretty good idea about how to read a novel. <laughs> you know, but if you've never read anything like this, you have no idea what is this thing. Yeah. And then somebody tells you, and you say, "Oh, yeah, well, that's what it is." 
So the thing is, if you read 20 apocalypses, <laughs> the way you read 20 novels, then you kind of get the hang of it. <laughs> and so the deal is, is that the book of Revelation is not the only book like this from the ancient Jewish and Christian worlds. There are a number of apocalypses that were written at the time. They have certain characteristics, just like a limerick poem has certain characteristics. Mm -hmm. And if you understand the characteristics, then you understand what the author is trying to do rather than coming up with something because you have no idea and somebody's told you what it means. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then most of the time, if you're in if you're in this kind of circle I was in, fundamentalist circles, the authors who are telling you what this means also don't know that there are these other apocalypses out there. They don't know the genre. Yeah. And so part of my point of my book is to say, okay, let's try to understand what this would mean in its own context. Mm -hmm. Because this author was trying to communicate something to his own readers 2,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he does, he's not planning on writing for 21st century America. He's writing, he's actually writing for people living in what's now Turkey, Western Turkey, uh, Christians in churches in Western Turkey uh, in the, at the end of the first century. Mm -hmm. And so you have to understand what the genre is and what his own historical context is, or you're just going to be taking the thing out of context. Sure. So is there any way, do we do, can we like put ourselves in the place of these original readers and can we draw some conclusions about what they might have been understanding when they were reading this? Like, did they, did they get this? Did they understand what they were reading or were they also kind of maybe like, this is way out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dragons we and all know. these different things, seven heads. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, you know, in the Christian schools at the time, they didn't assign a reading report, so, you know, book book reports on this one. And so right. we don't have we don't have like their book reports to say what they what they made of it. Mm -hmm. What we do have are uh, we have a lot of other books like it that mm -hmm. we do have readers reports on, and we have reader later re reader reports uh, on this book uh, that help us understand how ancient people took it. Uh, and so, and there. are if you know if you know how this kind of literature works, there are if you just have a basic idea about how this kind of literature works, there are plenty of clues within the text itself mm -hmm. that unpack its meaning that you'll just miss otherwise. Mm -hmm. But if you're kind of used to looking for this kind of thing, you'll you'll see it, uh, and it will be pretty clear that this this author is not referring to events that are going to be transpiring in the 21st century. So he's speaking about their what would have been modern day events for them going on in their lifetime, not so much about the future. Yeah. I and mean, this isn't a radical view. I mean, this mm -hmm. is a view that historical scholars have had for a very long time. And even I mean, and I, you know, it's not like an atheist view or something. This is sure. this is just so biblical scholars who are experts in the study of Revelation. And there are, there are a lot of them. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they agree. This is John writing for people, writing for his audience. And he tells you what his audience is. Mm -hmm. he, he tells you who he's writing for. He's writing for these Christians in these seven churches in Western Asia Minor. Mm -hmm. And he's trying to communicate something to them. Yeah. All right. So one of the, we, there's. I was reading through your book and there's like, I have so many questions. There are tons of rabbit holes that we could climb down. But one of the topics I really want to drill into a little bit is the topic of the rapture, uh, because a lot of our listeners come from the evangelical or come from the evangelical world. So they're kind of rethinking a lot of the things they were handed. And like myself, many of them have told me that they were terrified of the rapture uh, growing up. And I wasn't really afraid of it because uh, I thought I was going to be left behind because of course I have all the right beliefs. I was afraid that everybody else who I loved was going to be left behind. And one of the things I love about your book is that you spend a considerable amount of time uh, kind of talking about this topic and really diffusing some of the misunderstandings around it. So I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit uh, about how this theology or this idea that Jesus is going to return to take his faithful people away while the rest of the world burns, uh, how that stands up or maybe doesn't stand up, I should say, against the larger context and backdrop of Revelation? Like, where do people typically find the rapture in Revelation? And then do those findings have even a shred of credibility, given the background and context uh, that you shared? And I should say, too, I know there are verses outside of Revelation that are referred to as well, and I'm going to ask you about those next. But for now, uh, within Revelation, how does the rapture stand up in the midst of all that? Uh, well, it doesn't stand up very well. Um, the word <laughs> rapture doesn't occur uh, in the book of Revelation. Um, Revelation is about the um the calamities that god is going to send against against earth mm -hmm. uh at the at the end of time mm -hmm. and it'll be disaster after disaster after disaster that's going to hit uh the planet and there's no passage that mentions jesus coming back to take people out uh, of the world that's 
I assume that almost all your readers know that mm -hmm. the rapture is this doctrine that Jesus comes back before all of this nastiness hits the planet, gets them out. And so the people who are left behind are the ones who have to experience the, the, uh, the, what, what people believe in the rapture called the seven year tribulation. Mm -hmm. There's nothing about a seven year tribulation in the book of Revelation. There's nothing about a rapture, nothing about Jesus coming back to take people out. Um, out of the world to take his followers out of the world. Um, the only ones who are out of the world in Revelation that are up in heaven are are Christians who have been martyred, mm -hmm. um, uh, who do show up. But but there's no there's no rapture. And so, you know, when you're reading a book and you believe in the rapture, and the rapture's not in the book, then you have to try and find some place <laughs> where you're like, oh, it's got to be in here somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> and so so I think what people what um, what typically prophecy writers say is that in in chapter four, what happened? So the way the the first part of Revelation, the first three chapters mm -hmm. are John having a vision of who of Christ mm -hmm. at, in chapter one, and then him being instructed to write to the, the churches of Asia Minor, the seven churches that he's writing to. And Christ dictates these letters. This will be important in a minute. He dictates these letters to the seven churches, and he says, you know, you, you, some of them are doing things fine, but they have, need some improvement. Others are really messing things up, mm -hmm. and all of them have problems. And he tells each one of them, you better shape up, because if you don't, I'm going to take away your lampstand. <laughs> the <laughs> lampstand is like the, you know, Christ's presence in the church, and so mm -hmm. he's, going to, he's going to condemn them. Um, and then in chapter four, you start getting into what people are looking for, which is the real action. <laughs> and the way the real action begins is John sees a door up in heaven or a window up in heaven, and and a voice comes down for him to go up. And he goes up and he has a vision of the throne room of God. Mm -hmm. And that's where he starts seeing what's going to start happening on the earth. And so I think people who want who are trying desperately to find <laughs> something like a rapture uh, they uh, that's what they they look at is john going up into heaven and that's a that's an image of the rapture for them yeah so it's it's funny to me because like i mean growing up i had i was one of those people that had like the end times charted out on my wall you know like i, I drew it all out and i figured all the the years out and things like that and like it was it was it was so clear to me at that point that there is this seven-year tribulation there is all these things that are going to happen but do, do people typically come to those kinds of conclusions because they're reading the text apart from that genre that you spoke of before? Like when you when you just read it like at a surface level without considering the context, without considering the genre, I would think it's easier to come to these kinds of conclusions. You would never come to those conclusions yourself if somebody hadn't told you there, there were the conclusions to come to. Yeah, that's true. Um, so the first time I read Revelation, I was... I was um, after high school, I, I decided to go to Moody Bible Institute, mm -hmm. uh, which, of course, is a, a bastion of fundamentalism and a very strong believer in uh, the rapture and the the, the soon the end that's coming soon. Mm -hmm. And um, I had read the Bible. I'd read I had read the whole New Testament before going to Moody, but I knew there was this entrance exam. <laughs> I was a little yeah. nervous about like bombing. <laughs> so, so I decided, oh God, I got to read the Book of Revelation because it might be on the exam. I don't want to feel like an idiot. <laughs> so I. So like two weeks before I went to Moody, I read Revelation. Like, oh my God, I have no idea what this is. What in the world is this? <laughs> I, I really don't understand this book. And so I, it wasn't until I got to Moody that I started reading interpretations of the book, especially mm -hmm. Hal Lindsey, the late great planet Earth. And once somebody tells you, oh, this means that, and this means that, yeah. and this means that, then you say, oh yeah, that makes sense, okay. And then once you get it in your head, it's like, that's how you read it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's like, it's like if you're, you know, if you're told that Puff the Magic Dragon is about marijuana, then you, that's all you hear. You, you can't unsee it. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. <laughs> you, you can't get it out of your head. It's, <laughs> and so, so, but nobody would read the book of Revelation to come away with a rapture in chapter yeah. four, they just, unless they were told that's what it is. Yeah. And the tribu seven year tribulation, you wouldn't get that out of Revelation. Where do you get seven year tribulation from? You get, yeah. you know, you get from somewhere else and you put right. it into Revelation. Right. All right. So what about the verses then outside of Revelation that are used to argue for the rapture? Because I feel like those verses are much more convincing than the arguments that are usually made within, within the book. Because I grew up hearing about, I think it's Matthew 20 something where Jesus talks about two people being in the field and the son of man comes and one disappears because he's raptured away, I was told, and then yeah. Paul and I think it's first yeah, yeah. or I think it's first Thessalonians talking about people floating yeah. into the air, right? To meet G to meet yeah, Jesus yeah. when he returns. And on the yeah, surface, yeah. again, like they seem 
pretty yeah, convincing. Right. Like what else are they yeah. possibly talking about? But yeah, again, right. there's context to consider. So maybe for those of us who twitch at the mention of those verses, <laughs> talk to us a bit about the context of those two passages. Yeah. No, no, the, uh, they do. You know, if you don't, if if you've got rapture in your head and you read those verses, they, they're, they're the rapture. It's yeah. just, that's what you hear. Has to be. It's like, yeah. And it's like, you know, uh, yesterday I teach in my class, one of my classes, and I say, you, you cannot, I told my students, you cannot read Isaiah 53 and not think of the crucifixion of Jesus. Mm -hmm. you, know, you just can't do it. Yeah. But any Jew in the ancient world who read Isaiah 53 never thought it's talking about a Messiah. Mm -hmm. So it just depends what's in your head, you know? And so, yeah. okay. So, I mean, to take this verse from Matthew, there'll be, uh, you know, there'll be uh, two, two in bed, one will be taken, one will be left. Uh, when the Son of Man comes, and there'll be two women working at a millstone, one will be taken, one will be left. And so, well, that's the rapture, right? Yeah, unless you read the context. If you actually read that passage, mm -hmm. it says that it's like happened in the days of Noah, when the flood destroyed uh, everybody. Everybody was taken away, but only eight were left. Mm -hmm. Okay. If one person is taken and one is left, and it's like the days of Noah, the one taken is destroyed. <laughs> the one who's left is the one who survives. Right. The one who leaves <laughs> so, is in trouble. <laughs> you, you want to be left behind in the right. magic passage. <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be destroyed by God otherwise. Right. So, so just again, it's just taking it out of the context. Mm -hmm. The first Thessalonians passage, it's, uh, it's first Thessalonians uh, chapter four verses 13 through 18, where Paul is writing to the Thessalonians. So again, you, it, it's important to understand the context mm -hmm. uh, of, of this thing. This is Paul's first letter, and the letter is being written to Christians in Thessalonica, mm -hmm. uh, Christians that he had converted who are upset because he had told them that Jesus was returning soon, very soon, uh, and that they'd be rewarded at Jesus' return, and they'd be given an eternal kingdom. Uh, and so they were eager for that. Mm -hmm. But Time has passed, and some people in the in the community have died, mm -hmm. and uh, they're upset because the, they're afraid these people have lost out on the benefits of salvation now because they died before it came, and they're mm -hmm. you know they're friends and neighbors and family and things. And so Paul's writing the letter to tell them that you don't need to be upset about these people who have have died, because when Christ returns, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive who are left. Will uh, will also go up and meet meet Christ in the air, mm -hmm. so we will always be together with the Lord. So okay, well that sounds like, you know, it sounds like that's the closest Living thing up, you think right? of. <laughs> right. We're going up to meet Jesus, and so right. the problem is that G that Paul, in this context, is not talking about Jesus taking people out of the world uh, before a seven year tribulation. He's talking about when Jesus comes to rule the world. Um, see, let me give you an image. So this is part of the importance of the context. Um, the language he uses, um, sometimes people call this the parousia. Um, uh, I don't know if people, I can't remember if people in the evangelical circles use that term, but we, uh, parousia is the term for the second coming of Jesus, the, mm -hmm. the, the coming of the presence of Jesus. This language of somebody coming and others going out to meet him is the language that was used and the word parousia was used to refer to what happened when a king would come to visit a city. Mm -hmm. So a king would be you know, the Roman emperor or something. The king would come to the city and the the city, knowing that the person's coming, would go out and they, they'd roll out the red carpet and they'd send the elite of the city out to greet the person and to give them honor and to revere them and then to bring them back into the city. Uh, to, for a celebration. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what's happening in this account is that the, the followers of Jesus are going up to meet him to bring him back down because he's going to rule the earth now. Mm -hmm. um, and those who are not on, so the dead are going to go first. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be privileged. And then we're going to go up right behind them. And then, then, then the idea is that you're not just like, you know, you're not living in the clouds. Mm -hmm. You're escorting Jesus back to rule the earth. Mm -hmm. Uh, and those who are not on that side will be destroyed at that moment. Mm. That's why you need to be alert and to be ready, because if you're not ready for Jesus, if you're, if you're not on Christ's side, you'll be destroyed at his return. The mm. early Christians didn't have an idea of Christians, of people being taken out of the world. They had the idea that Christ is coming back 
in judgment. And when he came back in judgment, he's going to wipe out everybody who was opposed to him. Mm. And so that's what First Thessalonians is talking about. And you can see that just in the context, because Paul, it, it, right after this, he starts talking about you need to be ready or you'll be destroyed. Mm. Um, but he's not talking about tribulation. He's talking about Christ annihilating people. So Paul then is not talking about, he's not painting a picture of like a, a literal event of people floating up to the sky. He's using terminology. Oh, he might, about people, he might be talking about people floating up in the sky. <laughs> yeah. But, but they're floating up the sky, not to be removed for, at a rapture. They're welcoming Jesus down as the king of the earth. Okay. And as king of the earth, he's, he, he's coming to destroy his enemies. Hmm. And that's, that's for Paul how the kingdom of God comes. As Christ destroys his enemies, and only the, the righteous are, are left, and they rule the earth. So then in the Matthew passage, pedaling back to that one, is this what, is, what, is, is, is what Jesus is referring to as well? Is he referring to this, this coming of the Son of Man, like in judgment? Is he referring to the yeah. same thing that Paul's talking about? Well, he's talking, I mean, the question is whether, I mean, Paul's talking about Jesus coming back. Right. Jesus is talking about the Son of Man coming in, in judgment. Mm -hmm. And the, one of the big issues in scholarship is whether when Jesus talks about the Son of Man coming in judgment, whether he's talking about himself. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the Gospels, he's the, in the Gospels understand that he is talking about himself. Mm -hmm. um, and so in Matthew, this is Jesus' return in, in power. Um, but the question is whether that's what the historical Jesus thought, which is a separate question. Got it, because Son of Man is is a terminology used like in Daniel, correct? Yeah, it comes from Daniel chapter seven, mm -hmm. where um, you have these kingdoms that are going to take over the earth one after the other that are fierce, beast-like, mm -hmm. wicked kingdoms. And then the after these kingdoms come, one like a son of man comes from heaven to wipe them out and to take over the earth. And so that's Daniel seven. Okay. So let's get into um, a little bit of the weeds of our friend Tim LaHaye, who's the the mastermind of of the Left Behind series. I mean, we can untangle a few things that I know I was handed growing up and, and some of our listeners as well, but uh, all the more relevant because I think there's a new movie coming out pretty soon uh, in the Left Behind series. So I'm sure you'll be first in line. <laughs> well, there's been, there's been three already. It's it. And, They're coming out with another one. <laughs> yeah. And so I, but I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, it's a little hard to imagine going down into the weeds with Tim LaHaye because he's really not in the weeds. Right. <laughs> you you wish he would get down there sometime and actually <laughs> get in there, but okay. <laughs> right. Well, to prepare for the conversation, I went back into some of my old uh, Revelation books from my evangelical days, and there's one called uh, Revelation Unveiled, which is his, he calls it sort of his commentary uh, on the book of Revelation, where a lot of the theology he says behind the Left Behind series comes from. And he has this one section that I wanted to read uh, for our listeners and have you respond to. It's uh, a chapter on the rapture. And the section is called expecting a pre-tribulation rapture is not new. Now there's some word, there's some names in here, Bart, that I might get wrong. So you can correct me if I pronounce okay. them wrong, which I probably will. But he says for several years, a popular argument against the rapture is that it was invented by John Darby in the last century, 1828, it was never seen or mentioned by the early Christian fathers for almost 19 centuries of church history. This argument, he said, is simply not true. And then he says, there's an electrifying discovery of a statement in an apoc apocalyptic sermon from the fourth century. The author is designated pseudo Ephraim, pseudo meaning false, because there is some question as to whether or not it was really written by Ephraim of Nisibis, a prolific Syrian church father. Some prefer a later date for the sermon called Sermon on the End of the World, suggesting that it may have been written sometime between 565 and 627. For our purpose, the date is immaterial, for even allowing it as late as the 7th century proves that Christians 1100 years before the time of Darby saw the rapture happening before the tribulation. Then he goes on and he quotes from the sermon. But his main argument is that this Syrian church father apparently talked about uh, the rapture. So it seems like LaHaye is trying to get into the weeds of history and probably talk about a name that people aren't aware of. But I'm curious, like, how do you respond to this claim that the rapture is not new uh, because it was in the writing of this Syrian church father? Is there any substance to that at all? Does that have any impact on the conversation? So I would say he's not in the weeds. I'd say what happens is that he sees a, uh, he sees some weeds uh, from a long distance and thinks that it's a uh, cornfield. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I can assure you that he has not read the sermon. Right. Uh, <laughs> he's quoting somebody who told somebody who told somebody about this sermon. Mm -hmm. So Ephraim or Ephraim, you could pronounce me Ephraim. Ephraim. Ephraim was a he was an important church father in Syria. Mm -hmm. He wrote uh, he wrote in Syriac. Mm -hmm. He was um, so around the time of the like the when the Council of Nicaea. He was a young man and he was so he's that period and he's very or orthodox. He wrote a lot of hymns. We had like five hundred of his of his hymns. Mm -hmm. He's an important figure for scholars of early Christianity. I was on a dissertation committee at Duke some years ago, but a, a student who was doing a dissertation on Ephraim, and um, very really really significant and interesting stuff. Hmm. But it's not it's not the kind of thing that uh, most people would know about or read. Mm -hmm. And he's he's correctly pointing out that the sermon that it, that later got attributed to Ephraim is, was probably not not by Ephraim. And it's um, it's not in Syriac, but it's uh, but it's uh, so it's it's a sermon on the. Uh, yeah, it's just it really what the sermon is, is a. Um, it's a kind of a, it's not very long. It's kind of a riff on uh, this passage in Second Thessalonians, mm -hmm. where in Second Thessalonians, uh, we learn that the at the end of time, this Antichrist figure has to go into the temple and uh, declare himself God. Mm -hmm. And and all disasters are going to hit the earth at that time. Uh, and so uh, what what LaHaye quotes in this book is a little passage mm -hmm. uh from this sermon that he takes completely out of context mm -hmm. and he doesn't know that he takes it out of context because he hasn't read the sermon <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> so it'd be kind of like you know if i'm describing the rapture in my book which mm -hmm. i do if i describe it and somebody takes my description out of the context and just quotes the description, they could say, so Bart Ehrman believes in the rapture. Because right. here he describes what's going to happen. Right. Like, what? Right. On page 110, Bart says this. So there it goes. It settles it. <laughs> there, there it so I actually, uh, I, I looked this thing up this mm -hmm. morning. Uh, and I knew this was going to be like, I, I knew this is this is not going to be good for Timothy Lay because there's no way that Ephra <laughs> believed in their after. And so let me just tell you what's happening here. Mm -hmm. He's describing what happens when the man of sin comes. And uh, this is the man, the Antichrist, who goes into the temple and declares himself God, and all hell is going to break out on earth. And uh, and he said, this is what he's, I'll quote it to you. Mm -hmm. He says, there will be calamity on earth, unlike that any that came before us. Fear will fall upon all people. They'll be overcome with terror. Children will renounce their father and follow after the evil one. Priests will abandon their altars to serve as heralds. People will flee to the cemeteries. Okay, so he's talking about like, you know, because the Antichrist has taken over here on earth and it's going to be horrible. And so this is the passage that he's quoting. He's, Ephraim says, people will flee to the cemeteries and he will, they will hide themselves among the dead. So they're going to be hiding behind tombstones and stuff, pronouncing the good fortune of the deceased who had avoided the calamity. Blessed are you, they'll say, blessed are you who were born away to the grave and hence you, will es you have escaped from the afflictions. But as for us, woe is us, for when we die, the vultures will serve as escort for us. <laughs> and it goes on like that. So he's talking about people who, he, when he says that people have been taken out of the world and avoided the tribulation, <laughs> he's not talking about the rapture. He's talking about people who died before this thing hit. <laughs> mm. And and because lucky them, they don't have to go through this. It is nothing, it is nothing to do with the rapture. But if you take mm. it, if you take it out of its context, mm -hmm. you can make it sound like a rapture, which is what he's done. Like you said earlier, when you take when you believe in the rapture and you bring that lens with you to a writing like this, you can't help but see you see the rapture in there, even though it's not there. You'll find this one all over the Internet. Just look it up and you'll <laughs> find people from whatever fundamental school or another, you know, using this to say, see, see, and, yeah. you know, it was around. And you'll notice that Tim LaHaye doesn't quote anybody else. Like if mm -hmm. this was around 1100 years earlier, why did nobody, why, why is it in one place? <laughs> and then when you read it, it's not in that place. Right, right. <laughs> so, okay. yeah. It was invented by Darby. Yeah. And so yeah. I explained that in my book. In my sure. book, I actually have a, a, an explanation uh, of, where, uh, of where the idea of the rapture came from. 
and I put it in its historical context because there's there for for serious historians, there's no doubt this is something that Darby came up with, and it caused a huge furor in his day. Mm. Um, uh, even among his father, there was a split in his community because of it. Mm. There was a there was there, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there was the belief there were a couple beliefs, right? There was a belief that the rapture would happen before the tribulation. There was a belief the rapture would happen after the tribulation. And I think yeah. there was maybe like more than one things like that, right? Like there was a whole bunch of different beliefs about. It. Is that correct? Well, so the the original belief is um, Darby's idea was that there's going to be uh, the rapture before the tribulation, mm -hmm. and then other people thought it was going to come after the tribulation. So his view came to be called pre-tribulation rapture, and then the other view came to be called post-tribulation rapture. Then there are some people who start arguing there's a mid-tribulation rapture that happens after three and a half years. Right. And so those are the three positions staked out. And there still are people, there are still uh, very uh, committed Christians who support one or the other of those views. Yeah. When, I was at, when I was at Moody, I heard a Jack Van Impey give a speech. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Jack Van Impey is another one of these guys who um, has has who spent decades saying that the rapture is going to happen very soon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I can say very soon, 20 years later, right? It's a book. I say, now the signs are being fulfilled. You know, right. 10 years later, I have, now the signs are being fulfilled. But at one point, <laughs> one in the speech, he said that he was so much in support of pre-tribulation rapture. So people call that your pre-trib. Mm -hmm. He said, I am so pre-trib. That at breakfast I won't eat post toasties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When, <laughs> when did you say? When did like all this start to unravel for you? Because I know like obviously you went to Moody, and so there was yeah. a season in your life where you were on board with this sort of stuff. But when, yeah. like, yeah, did, and I know like you you stepped away from the faith, all those different things. Like, when did all of this start to hit you? Like to yeah. start rethinking all this kind of stuff. Yeah, when I was at Moody, there was a popular um, there was a popular bumper sticker among evangelical Christians that said, uh, "In case of rapture, this car will be abandoned." Yes, <laughs> so it's like a bumper sticker. And then a few years later, I saw one that I rather liked. It said, "In case of rapture, I want your car." <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this started <laughs> this started falling apart for me when I. Um, when I went to Princeton Theological Seminary and started mm -hmm. reading the New Testament seriously in uh, Greek and reading the Old Testament in Hebrew and started studying um, studying the Bible from a historical perspective to try and understand it in its its own context. Mm -hmm. And I came to realize that um, that the Hal Lindsey approach, you know, the late great planet Earth, where you can predict what's going to happen in the Middle East leading to this crisis that's going to wipe everything out by 1988, uh, that that whole thing was being imposed mm -hmm. on the text and that it really wasn't coming out of the text. Mm -hmm. And we had we had always learned that you're supposed to do exegesis instead of eisegesis. Mm -hmm. So exegesis was where you, t you draw the meaning out of a text. Eisegesis is when you put the meaning into the text that you've already mm -hmm. got. And I realized, you know, this is just, this is just making the text say something. It doesn't actually say that. Yeah. And once you realize that, then the whole thing kind of falls apart. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, you know, probably early on after I stopped being an evangelical, I stopped believing in something like the rapture. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't that, you know, that of course wasn't related to my leaving the faith. That was just sure. as a Christian, I realized that's just not true. Yeah. Yeah. So what is the, the, what is the purpose of this book for modern day people? Because you you talked about how earlier you said that, you know, John was writing to his, the writer was writing to his particular group of people going through a particular set of circumstances in their day. But you also say later on in the book, you have a quote, I think it's, I think I have it here somewhere. You say the book that continue. this is a book that continues to be massively significant, even if for reasons people might not expect. And so- yeah. If if the book is not significant in the sense that it's telling us, it's detailing what's going to happen at the end of our our time and that we're going to be raptured away, all these different things. Like if the significance doesn't lie in there, if it's being really written for these early people, what is the significance for us, for you, me, for our listeners? Today? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, when I started writing the book, I, my initial idea was to contrast the evangelical interpretation of revelation as predicting our immediate future mm -hmm. to contrast that with what historians 
have long said, that it's not that. Mm -hmm. That in fact, the book of Revelation is describing what the prophet John thinks is going to happen in his own day. Mm -hmm. And uh, that his enemy is not, you know, the Soviet Union or China or, and he's not describing events that are going to transpire because of oil crises in the Middle East. It's not what the, the book is about. Mm -hmm. It's actually about the uh, domination of, uh, of, of uh, the people of God by Rome, mm -hmm. the ancient Rome. And it's about the Roman Empire and about how John envisions that the Roman Empire is going to be destroyed by God. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can demonstrate this. And this is, this is not a controversial view among scholars. This is what scholars have long recognized for reasons that I explain in the book. Mm -hmm. um, so my book was originally going to be to contrast the, the kind of fundamentalists who I was raised on about the rapture and the tribulation and, and all that is in our future with the historical view and to show why historians just don't read it as predictions of our future. I thought, well, that would be significant. But the more I thought about it, I thought, you know, and I, and that's about half the book is that. I mean, that is half the book is trying to show that. But then I realized, you know, it's also important to see why this view of things, this view that this is talking about our imminent future, why that is a really dangerous view. And, if, and even in ways that it's not particularly dangerous, it's influential. Mm -hmm. uh, even among people who don't really know that's what we, we don't even think that's what Revelation's about. So the second part of my book is about the uh, about the kind of damage that 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 view has done historically uh, it's done terrible psychological damage as you were saying you know a lot of your friends were afraid of the rapture and as children and when i was uh, i was long before your time but in my time in the 70s um there was a movie out that every evangelical saw about 48 times called uh, thief in the night yeah. which was meant to terrify people about being left behind and just about every evangelical i know who took that movie seriously was terrified because they thought it had happened at one point or another that they'd been left behind it's yeah. so, <laughs> very bad psychological damage for people but more than that it's led to it's led to a serious violence over the years yeah. uh, i try to show in my book for example how the whole a disaster at Waco with David Koresh, um, where the FBI uh, laid siege to the the Branch Davidian compound, and there ended up being a slaughter mm -hmm. uh, of people. Uh, that that was that was largely rooted in David Koresh's understanding of the Book of Revelation uh, and his his interpretation that it was predicting their martyrdom, mm -hmm. and that whole thing was because partly because of that. Uh, so there's that kind of thing. But there are also, I tried to show uh, after that, I show that, in fact, even for people who have no interest in the Bible particularly, they're affected by this view of things. Um, I, I try to show, for example, that U.S. foreign policy has been in, affected by this evangelical interpretation mm -hmm. of, uh, of the end times, um, uh, especially in, in terms of American support for, for the nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't take a stand... A political stand on that, but I do point out how this expectation the end is coming soon uh, has has dramatically changed uh, the American foreign policy for, for including the move of the embassy mm. um, and to Jerusalem. And I talk about its effect on things like climate change mm. and American policy toward climate change and social policy about climate change. And so a variety of things sure. that actually are affecting all of us, hmm. whether we are, uh, you know, whether we're interested in the Bible or committed to the Bible or not, it has this interpretation of Revelation has very serious effects. Hmm. And so I, I try to lay those out uh, in the book. So like for people who are listening, maybe like pastors or teachers, like what are what are ways to steward this book well when you're delivering it to people that you're responsible to teach? Like, because obviously the the whole end times thing, like that's out the window. But if if somebody's going to use this this book and they're going to teach from it, like what are what's a good way to steward this text? I tell you, it's I think it's very difficult to use it responsibly mm -hmm. because not just because it's been misinterpreted, but also because when it's rightly interpreted, it's a very disturbing book. Yeah. Uh, not because it's predicting our future, but because of the view of God and Christ that it presents. Yeah. And so the very end of my book, I deal with this issue about whether the God of Revelation 
is the God that Jesus talked about in the Gospels, and whether the Jesus portrayed in the book of Revelation is the Jesus of the Gospels, because the Jesus and God of Revelation uh, are all about vengeance and uh, blood and uh, revenge and violence and wrath. The book never never says anything about God, God loving anyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, there's, I used to think, even as, even as a professional scholar for years and for decades, I taught that this book was a book of hope mm-hmm. for those who are suffering. And I've come to realize it's not a book about hope for the future for, for most people. It's, it's just the, the word hope never occurs in the book of Revelation. Mm-hmm. The love of God never occurs in the book of Revelation. What occurs are words like wrath and vengeance and blood. And it's God's wrath against the planet. And you might think, well, that's, you know, that's God's justice. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, God is just and sin, uh, you know, requires punishment. And so this is the punishment. And so I I get that. But one of the things I talk about in the book is how this is not just destruction of the enemy. This is torture. Mm -hmm. There are scenes of torture where God tortures people for months without allowing them to die. Uh, and uh, this, I don't think it's a pleasant view of God. I think the, it's a very uh, upsetting view of God when you actually allow yourself to see what it's saying yeah. um, and that it's not, um, you know, and and people say, well, yeah, it's just symbolic. Well, why are you using these symbols to represent God? Why do you want this image of God? Yeah. Someone who tortures people. Is that is that the image of God that you want to convey? And so I, I mean, you know, the author of Revelation obviously considered himself a Christian, mm-hmm. but there are lots of people who consider themselves Christian who don't, don't think in very Christian ways or behave in very Christian ways. And yeah. I, I, I think he would, cons- he would absolutely consider himself a stalwart follower of Christ, but I'm not sure if Jesus would have considered him to be a follower. Yeah. Um, so I, that's the kind of thing I talk about at the end of the book. Sure. All the, all the, all the realities of the violence in the book and the wrath and the torture, things like that. Is that part of the reason why? Cause I know, I know revelation was one of those books that almost didn't make it in to the final cut of the, of the new Testament. Is that one of the yeah. reasons why? So I have a chapter devoted to this about why, you know, about how it got in and the difficulties, the, the weird thing, <laughs> I think it's kind of weird is that the destructive part that we find is so disturbing. What is the part that the church fathers found disturbing? <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Most of them kind of like the idea of Rome getting wiped out like this. Right. <laughs> you know, they were kind of happy with that part. <laughs> what they didn't like, the, the thing that, there were two things that caused problems. One was that um, people, people didn't think that the author of Revelation was the same person who wrote the Gospel of John. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a little bit ironic because the Gospel of John doesn't claim to be written by somebody named John, mm-hmm. and but people call it John. The Book of Revelation does claim to be written by somebody named John, but they don't call it John. Right. <laughs> and so, so it's a little bit confusing. But, but um, so they weren't sure, and they were right. Whoever wrote Revelation did not write the Gospel of John. That's a mm-hmm. that's a firm conclusion of modern scholarship. And there were ancient scholars who were arguing. Biblical mm-hmm. New Testament Christian scholars said, yeah, this is not the same author, and they could mm-hmm. they could show it on uh, stylistic ground, linguistic grounds. Mm-hmm. Um, the bigger reason it didn't, it had trouble is because Revelation celebrates what's going to happen at the end once Christ destroys all of his enemies with a massive flow of blood. And what's going to happen is that the saints are going to inherit the earth and it's going to be a utopian existence where massive feasting and wealth and power and glory and you know so it'd be massive banquets with the, with a the lamb every night and mm-hmm. and the church fathers at the time when they were deciding which books would be in the new testament were leaning much more toward an ascetic lifestyle mm-hmm. where you didn't indulge in the pleasures of the flesh and revelation looks like it's moving it's trying to get these people who are suffering now to a place where they can indulge in the flesh for eternity uh, yeah and so the church fathers thought you know that just that's not really you know, the point is not to starve yourself now so you can feast later. The point right. is not to not to be so concerned about your physical state. And you should be concerned about your spiritual state. And this book is just concerned about the physical state. Yeah. And so they didn't like it, uh, like it for that reason. And it wasn't until church fathers in the fourth and fifth century started saying it's not actually literally talking about 
feast and things. Those are just symbols for, you know, that in fact, it's going to be a very uh, austere existence <laughs> <Got> it. <laughs> and that it's not talking about that. Uh, and that's when it got accepted. Got it. All right. Well, Bart, we are just about out of time, but uh, I, I could talk to you. I could listen to you all day, talk about this kind of stuff, but thank you for taking the time to join us. Thank you for this book. Thank you for your work. You're welcome. Yeah. Okay. So I, uh, uh, thanks for having me on. It, it was, it was an interesting book to write. And uh, I, uh, I, it's one of the most uh, most interesting books to write that I've ever written, I think, because it's just like I got me digging into so much stuff that I really didn't know much about until I wrote it. So, yeah. yeah. Are there any plans that makes me think, are there any plans of any like um, resources coming out around the book? Like any time I know you do some videos, things like that, some teaching. Is there anything like that in the works? Um, there's there's um, I've been doing some lectures and things and I've mm -hmm. some online lectures. I, I do these online uh, courses off my website mm -hmm. and I've done and I'm going to do a lecture um, uh, on on the rapture, actually, uh, uh, as a kind of standalone lecture sometime uh, in April or something. Uh, and so just that kind of thing. Uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't have anything else in the works other than just kind of uh, that kind of thing, uh, lectures and, and such. Awesome. And last thing, do you want to plug your, your blog real quick? Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah, for those who don't know, I have a, I have a blog, Barterman blog. It's gone on for over 10 years now. I blog five times a week, uh, done every week for over 10 years, lots of blogs out there and it's all everything having to do with the new Testament and early Christianity. People have to pay a small fee to join. Uh, I don't make a dime from it myself. Uh, all the money that comes in uh, goes to charity and uh, dealing with hunger and homelessness mainly. And um, so, uh, and it's the blog is really, it's been growing and growing. I'd like more people to join. It's all word of mouth. Last year we raised, we raised uh, over half a million last year, over $500,000 from wow. the blog. And it all went to these, all went to charities. And so, um, but and people can ask me questions about my blog posts. Yeah. I, I post on Revelation a lot <laughs> these days, <laughs> and and I answer every question I get. Uh, uh, and so uh, people should think about it. look at it. It's just called the Bart. Just look up the Barter blog. Awesome. Well, I'll put the link in the show notes, and we'll be in touch, Bart. Okay. okay. Thanks so much. Thanks. Bye.